Um, I'm going to start with you, Chef AJ. Uh, you know, a, a, a little bit, a, a little bit of what we were talking about before, um, which is, um, how how do you get started on a plant based diet? How or how do you how do you bring people along? And you you didn't answer that question, but I think that's a great start for this topic on plant based diets. Well, well, for me, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I can't right. convince them with the science. I mean, I could recommend the science. I just do it with delicious food. And you know, I did it for many years in Los Angeles as a pastry chef. It wasn't even a vegan restaurant, but all my desserts were vegan, sweetened with dates without oil or salt. But they 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 stood the test of time because they were delicious. So I just do it with the food. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So uh, Dr. Nagra, how would you suggest coming from a more uh, science-based perspective to uh, to get people to go to a plant-based diet? And I believe you are muted. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, I mean, it, it really depends on what their concerns are. Normally when people are looking at plant-based nutrition, there, there's some sort of motivator there. You know, maybe they're interested in the environmental aspect. Maybe they're um, interested in the animal rights side. And I talked about this in my talk a bit earlier, um, or maybe they have heard about some of the health benefits, but they have some questions or concerns. So it'll be different for each person. I typically ask them, well, what are your concerns? What is motivating you? And I'll share the science related to that topic. Um, just kind of jumping off what AJ said too, around you know, sharing delicious food. Um, one thing that I do with a lot of my patients is um, I'll look at what they already eat right? So we'll review their diet, we'll see what they already eat. And I'll see what are little things we can change. You know, if they're having, you know, meat sauce in their in their pasta, you know, beef sauce, maybe we swap that for lentils into the pasta, you know, it's a similar overall kind of recipe, similar flavor, similar type of food. Um, but obviously a, a healthier option and, 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 you know, shift towards a more plant based option. So, um, so it's a, it kind of depends on the individual. Thank you. Chef AJ, so along those lines, what would be, what do you find when you're, when you're working with somebody are the easier things to introduce or to, to swap out? Dessert. Um, <laughs> I, just, okay. I, I just want to point out, John McDougall has just typed in the chat that McDougall is here. I don't know if anyone saw that, but I, you know, I, I, okay. So here's the thing, you know, people that are hardcore, you know, junk food junkies that are eating a McDonald's, you know, I've never tasted the beyond burger or the impossible burger. So I can't vouch for whether it tastes as good or the same. But when I make a German chocolate cake, you can't tell that it doesn't have eggs, that it doesn't have dairy, that it doesn't have oil, that it doesn't have butter. And so so that is very familiar. They just know they're eating a delicious cake. Not everybody can step into this and love tofu and tempeh and seitan immediately. But like Dr. Niagara said, if it's familiar, you know, I mean, let, you know, when you make taco meat out of walnuts or lentils and you use the right spices, you don't know that you're not eating meat. You don't even have to go to the fake new stuff like the beyond this and the impossible that, but I like to hit them over the head with dessert. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that sounds like a great start for sure. So I actually, I'd like to try that, that chocolate muesli that you made earlier today. So um, real quick, a uh, question for you, uh, Dr. Nagra. What should our blood type be? Excuse me, our blood sugar level be ideally, and uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have Doctor McDougall on and do um, so he'll have you know an opinion on this. Um, do potatoes, sweet potatoes, and stuff like that contribute to having a higher blood sugar than desired? He's muted. Yeah, hold on one second here. Let me make sure that. You are unmuted. Not sure how that okay. happened. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, no, no, I muted myself so I wouldn't you wouldn't hear anything while, while AJ was speaking, but I won't do that now because then I can't unmute. Um, okay. So, yeah, so that question actually came up during my talk too. Now, in the Canadian, uh, like we use millimoles per liter up here and the, the fasting levels, you want them to be between 3.9 and 5.6 millimoles per liter. For um, in America, that translates to, I believe, 70 milligrams per deciliter to 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's what's considered the kind of normal healthy range. You don't want to be above that uh, in a fasting state. You also don't want to dip too far below that because you can be hypoglycemic, you can pass out, you can be really dangerous. Um, now, if you're talking about uh, post meal, I mean, you can go quite a bit higher. You can double that range after a meal because it's supposed to just be temporary. Your blood sugar rises after you eat some carbohydrates and then your body takes care of it and they drop right back down to baseline. Um, in cases where you have insulin resistance, um, so say prediabetes or, or diabetes, then yeah, it can remain elevated and that's a problem. But I would, I would hesitate to 
to you know tell anyone that that we need to be focusing too much on those short term spikes because I'm seeing that a lot now online uh, where people are trying to flatline their blood glucose, but then they end up eating things that are way less healthy. They're eating you know things like the butter and meat and whatever that are low in carbohydrates that maybe aren't going to spike blood sugar so much after a meal when that's a normal response. Um, and they end up doing themselves a disservice in the long run. Welcome, Dr. McDougall. Nice you guys to wait for me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So um, actually, so I, I had asked a question before you got here um, about blood sugar. So we're just going to jump right in, but uh, I wanted to thank you. It's it's an honor to uh, to talk to you and uh, and have you on the panel. So um, I, I was mentioning blood sugar and asking about um, various, um, various products or pr various foods, such as potatoes and, and, and starches like that. I know how you feel about, uh, about potatoes. What, what is your thought on, on, on the healthy level for blood sugar? And are there plants such as potatoes that, that contribute to unhealthy levels? Well, it depends on how you're listening to. Uh, when I first started medicine back 50 plus years ago, uh, a normal blood sugar was uh, considered below 200. And the marketplace wasn't very big with people with blood sugars over 200. Then the drug companies, uh, they think they can improve their business by increasing the market. And the way they did it, as they said, on normal blood sugar was above, it was below 160. And, and the next number that came out, it was 140 milligrams per deciliter. And as long as you were uh, below 140 milligrams per deciliter, you were not a diabetic. Now it's 126 milligrams per deciliter. That's the official number. What is a normal blood sugar? Well, you know, I, I know, I know people have run blood sugars of 40, 60, we're talking about without medication. And I would say you're probably looking at a, a range of somewhere between 70 and 110. Most people who are, I would consider normal would run that kind of level, but you know, people are fascinated by blood sugar levels. They pay a lot of attention to them and they try and make them normal with medications and what they should be doing. Because I have never seen a patient die of a high blood sugar. I've been at this business for you know, over a half a century. I have never seen sugar, nor high cholesterol, nor high blood pressure. What do they die of? They have rotten tissues, they have bad arteries. So we're looking at the wrong problem. We're looking at the signs of really serious illnesses, which are due to the food. And, you know, as long as you keep looking at signs and you have medications that make signs go away, good grief, I'm a real doctor. I can, I can make your cholesterol 30. I can make your blood pressure, you know, 50 over 20. I'm a doctor. I get a prescription pad. As long as we focus our attention on numbers like blood sugar and pills to fix the blood sugar, that's all we're going to get is low blood sugar is taking a lot of pills. Or we're never going to get healthy people. You've got to focus on the problem. So are there, are there any valid benchmarks in your opinion, such as cholesterol that are meaningful and are they just signs of health? Whereas just because you're lowering it with a, with a medicine doesn't mean you're actually preventing that, that tissue damage that's going to ultimately lead to their death. That's all very true. Are, are there reliable signs? Well, you know, you're taught in medical school, which is so true today. I was taught again, a half a century ago that you got to listen to the patient. You, you talk to the patient. The patient will tell you everything that's wrong with them. You know, that, that's where your indication of what the problem is and what to, you know, how to solve the problem. The, the, the signs, they just kind of support what you've already discovered by talking to the patient. So no, I mean, you know, I, I in fact, I think I probably originated the number, you know, a long time ago, uh, the number of 150 milligrams per deciliter or less as an ideal cholesterol. Uh, I would say a blood pressure of one, 110 over 70 or, or, or lower. Now, again, we're talking about without medication mm -hmm. would be okay. I think, you know, it's just like on the last show we were on together. I don't really remember that. Somebody asked what, how you would tell if somebody was obese. And, you know, the, the presenter, who, by the way, was a bit overweight, the presenter went into a whole discussion about BMI and scales and all kinds of things. And I innocently said this, all you need to do is take off your clothes and look in the mirror. I really didn't mean it as an offensive comment, it's just applied to that speaker that was on the panel last time. So, you know, I don't know. I, I just like, I'm, I'm into patience, okay? 
Uh, I, I know they get a lot of reward from seeing the cholesterol drop 100 points and getting off their blood pressure and diabetic medications. I know that. So, you know, I foster that in my practice, but, you know, you just have to listen to the patient. So the, the topic for today is whole food plant-based diets. Now, there are a lot of different people who have different opinions on the optimal diet. Uh, Dr. Nagra was talking um, earlier today, presented, and, and was talking about the, the various variables that make up a, a healthy diet. What is your idea of, a, uh, the, of the foundation of a healthy whole food plant-based doctor, uh, diet, Dr. McDougall? It's based on a million years of research. All large, successful populations have obtained the bulk of their calories throughout all of human history from starch. The ideal diet is a starch-based diet. Notice I didn't say vegan. I didn't even say vegetarian. I said starch. It happens that I teach and follow a vegan diet, a very low-fat vegan diet. Uh, let's look at some examples. Uh, if you take a look at the people from Central America or Mexico, these are known as the people of the corn. You know, they have a saying in Mexico, no corn, no country. Uh, you look at the Incas. The Incas lived on potatoes in the Andes, you know, for a thousand years, more than a thousand years. If you uh, if you go to the Far East, you see people, and all of the listeners will, will relate to this, you see people who primarily eat rice-based diets. Before 1980, 90% of the people in China lived on rice. Yes, it was white rice, but it was rice. And you look at the news tonight, and you'll see talks about uh, the Middle East, about the bread basket of the world, about Ukraine, Egypt, Iran, Iraq. They didn't call this the bread basket of the world for no reason at all. They didn't call it the pork chop basket of the world. It's a starch-based history that the human being has. And that's the best way I can describe it. You eat 90% of your diet as starch, as people have throughout all of verifiable human history, when they had food. You know, I, I don't have to add that caveat in there. I'm sure you realize that. So yeah, it's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. We recommend people do not eat animals. Animals at all, that means fish, chickens, cows, pigs, whatever. We, we recommend against that. And we recommend against free oils. Free oils would be things that don't exist naturally. You, you, you there are no oils in nature that are in a free form. Uh, to get an oil, you have to squash the olive or uh, press the corn. And what happens when you form oil is you form an isolated concentrated ingredient that is at best medicinal and worst poisonous. You have left behind the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins, the carbohydrates, everything's left behind. All you have is corn oil. It's not food. So the Two food poisons that I teach are animal foods and oils. And the diet for the human being is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. I just described for you the diet in two sentences. The McDougall diet is a diet based on starches, vegetables, and fruits. Second sentence, the McDougall diet does not contain animals or oils. That's okay. fair enough, I think. Uh, that was simple. So, so um, I want to come to you after I just want to ask uh, Chef AJ a quick question. How do you cook food and make it taste good without oils? It's like yeah. sauteing onions, garlic, all that stuff that people think they need oils for. You don't need oil. You really don't need anything. But if you really want to use a liquid, you can use water. You can use vegetable broth. You really, you, you don't need it. I don't know where this came from in culinary history. But you really don't need it. You need a good piece of cookware and you, you don't need oil. You save so many calories, so much time, so much money, uh, time on cleanup when you don't use oil. And, and it actually tastes better, as I mentioned in my previous talk, is when you use a lot of oil, you got to use a lot of salt to taste it because it coats your tongue. It's actually very easy. It's just people just, this is how people learn in culinary schools or from whoever teaches them to cook. You don't need oil. If you need a liquid, you can use water. It's free. Thank you. And Dr. Nagra, what, what do you think about the foundation of a plant-based diet? Yeah, I mean, I think the the foundations. Um, I, again, I did talk about it in my uh, my presentation earlier, but a foundation of fruits, veggies, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Th those are the general foundations. Now, I'm not 
I think from a calorie standpoint, limiting oil, absolutely. Um, from a you know heart health standpoint, I, I haven't seen data suggesting that it is necessarily an issue. And, and in fact, um, especially polyunsaturated fat rich oils tend to lower risk of cardiovascular disease based on, you know, nurses health study, health professionals follow up study, the LA Veterans Administration hospital study, um, and by lowering lipids like again, LDL cholesterol and whatnot, which I, I know there's a, a little bit of uh, discussion there earlier, but, but again, no matter how we lower LDL cholesterol, whether it's through, um, through medications like statins, PTSK9 inhibitors, dietary intervention, bile acid sequestrants, we lower the risk regardless of the mechanism. So I, I think that's pretty compelling data that, that those are you know, markers to, to look at as well. And that's where oils can be quite beneficial for people. But, um, but generally speaking, especially if weight loss is the goal, um, then yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do think uh, limiting oil can go a long way for a lot of people. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, I just came from a panel with, with uh, um, Dr. Gabriel Cousin and Brian Clement, and they were very big on um, fruct fructose being a problem and you know fruits that contain fructose being a, a problem in the diet um and then they were into beneficial fats not animal fats but um you know but nuts and seeds those types of things um so dr nagra what, what are your thoughts on the hazards of fruit for example um so i again i haven't seen any data suggesting harm i mean we have studies up to like over a dozen servings uh, in a day and the one side effect was very big bowel movements. Like that was pretty much it, which most people could probably use that too. Um, so I am, I am not concerned about, you know, people consuming fruit. I think if somebody has diabetes and they're working on treating it currently um, and they were to have large amounts of fruit, then yeah, their blood sugar could be elevated for extended periods. So it's not something to go all in hundred percent on right out the gate, if that is you, but uh, for healthy individuals, I just haven't seen any evidence of, of harm. And in fact, fruit consumption is consistently associated with great health outcomes. Okay, thank you. And and Dr. McDougall, what are your thoughts on, on that hypothesis? Well, you know, the diet I teach is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. So the, the thing about fruit is that it's really tasty. And there's a reason it's tasty. It's part of the human diet. We are naturally attracted to things that are good to us, good for us. Uh, the problem is it's too tasty, especially when people first start the program that we teach. And they'll sit down, they'll eat, because it's familiar, because it's sweet, they'll eat, you know, 20 nectarines at a sitting. And you can get carried away with that much simple sugar. Simple sugars are not as satisfying. You don't, you don't stay satisfied with your hunger drive as long with simple sugars as you do with starches. So I think it's a nice side dish. Uh, I don't think you ever have to eat fruit. Likewise, I think if you eat more fruit than I just told you about, I think most people do. The other thing that you might think about, because you just talked about heart disease a little bit, is that you know, I found that simple sugars, uh, and including fruit and fruit juices, have a tendency to raise triglycerides, the fats in the blood. But that could be an issue. And then again, it's not a real strong risk factor. Triglycerides aren't. And then the, uh, the, most, the most important diet that served for me when I was learning about diet therapy uh, came from a, a Dr. Walter Kempner at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Kempner taught the uh, rice diet. Uh, he was there for seven decades. He's published in our major medical journals. He really is the, the pinnacle of diet therapy. And uh, Dr. Dr. Kempner would uh, you know cure obesity, uh, retinopathy and diabetics, uh, severe morbid hypertension, not the wimpy stuff that people listening to this program have. That was, that was his results published uncontested. He did it on a diet of rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. And I don't, I don't know. If, I mean, I, I use the Kempner diet when I'm taking care of patients that are really, really sick. I call it the diet for the nearly dead. So if somebody comes to me with 10% of their heart function left or you know 7% of their kidney function left, I will show them the can I say this is probably where you eventually should be. And so you know the idea that fruit is bad for us, you, you know how I feel. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with uh, Dr. Furman. 
And uh, Dr. Furman sees, uh, you know, a lot of vegan patients and he, he is stating that he is seeing some of them come in with dementia and people in the whole, you know, whole food plant-based community kind of think they're, they are bulletproof with a lot of these diseases. Um, I'll start off with, uh, with Dr. McDougall on this one. What do you think um, is the, is a, is, are the contributing factors that are leading uh, people who are eating plant-based to end up with, with dementia and symptoms of that sort? Dementia, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's, which is the cause of 60% to 80% of the dementia. Alzheimer's, aluminum poisoning, aluminum poisoning. The research is overwhelming. But the aluminum industry is a pretty big industry. And they have, uh, they have worked for all the time I've been in this business, which again is on nearly 50 years. Uh, with their propaganda, you know, trying to tell people it's an innocent factor. But if the people listening to this tape will take the trouble to go to the internet and look up aluminum and Alzheimer's. You'll spend the next two weeks reading the research. It's overwhelming. As far as uh, uh, one supplement or another selling something to prevent dementia, the first thing I'd ask the presenter is, do you sell supplements? then we can continue the conversation. Okay. And regarding the aluminum, what, what are, what are the, um, I know in cooking pans, people cook with aluminum pans. What other sources uh, are of aluminum are we exposed to? Well, they've come back, come back. They were kind of out of vogue for a while and that's antiperspirants. They're, they're starting to get popular again. You see them advertised for about five years. You know, they weren't anything, they weren't any antiperspirants that were sprays. They were rub-ons, but not sprays. They basically went out of business because the aluminum industry or the deodorant industry, the cosmetic industry, et cetera, they, they made an observation or the scientists did that, that do these kinds of things. And that is that the uh, Alzheimer's disease has a pathognomonic lesion. In other words, you see this lesion and you name the disease. These are called senile plaques and neurofibro tangles. You see them under a microscope and you can see them with an electron microscope. And uh, what they found is that the most severe cases of Alzheimer's use this portal of entry. This is a stalk of the brain, the olfactory lobe. And it, the aluminum gets up through here into the olfactory lobe and forms these senile plaques, the pathognomonic lesion for Alzheimer's. And so, um, there's another source. People are, every day they get up in the morning and they spray themselves with aluminum right in their face. So you've got uh, packaged products, you've got aluminum pots and pans, you've got cans, you've got industrial exposure, which used to be the primary source of inhaled, inhaled aluminum. Now it's these antiperspirants. So uh, it, it, it's, it's due to aluminum poisoning. Is there any way to get the aluminum out of our, well, I'm sorry, I missed the last yeah, thing. Yeah, there is, there is. In, in fact, you, you'll, you'll see there are some new therapies in the news these days on treating Alzheimer's with these new biologic agents. And somehow they get into the senile plaque and they, I, I, I haven't studied enough to tell you the whole details. Uh, they get a 36% reduction. That's the best they can brag about in deterioration of a patient with Alzheimer's. 36%. That's what they brag about in the newspaper yesterday, if you read it. Back in 1980, uh, researchers, they used a aluminum chelating agent called defroxamine or desferoxamine. And desferoxamine grabs a hold of the aluminum. So they treated patients with progressive severe Alzheimer's disease. This is published with desferoxamine. And they found that they reduced the progression in those treated in half. That's better than 36%. So why has desferoxamine not become a popular solution that you hear about? It's generic. It's not patentable. It all comes down to money, plain and simple. Now, there's another way to get aluminum out of the system, which is, doesn't involve a shot or a doctor or a prescription, and that is to consume silica. Not silicon, but silica. Silica is an organic silicon compound, and it's found in teas. It's found in silica water, which you can buy on the internet. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of sources of silica. So silica dra drags the aluminum, it's a chelating agent, out of the body. You can measure it in the urine. You can see that it has profound effects. 
So, you know, if somebody's not going to get into the medical business, doesn't need to, wants to, doesn't have any signs of Alzheimer's, and rather than going for the treatment that's been proved to work, does for oxymine. It's in the 1980s now, 40 years ago. But that doesn't mean it's not true. Then what Is they that can available do, on the market? Like, can a doctor prescribe that? Does for, oh, yeah, you can buy a doctor, your doctor can prescribe it. You can buy, actually, it's, it's, you just look, go, go to Google, type images, type test, does for oxymine, and it's available. Uh, you probably have to have a prescription for it. And is that something that, given our exposure to aluminum and the the dangers of aluminum with regard to Alzheimer's, is that right. something worth taking prophylactically? No, I wouldn't think so. No. Yeah, you got to give yourself two hundred muscular shots a day for a year. Oh, 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 oh okay, okay. So it's not just uh, some oral. Somebody who has early signs of Alzheimer's, this is your only chance, if you, unless you believe in the new drugs that are coming out, which cost, by the way. Between 26, one of the drugs, and the other one's $56,000 a year. Desferoxamine has got to be pennies. Wow. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, there's one underlying message of motivation. It's called money. And if you think otherwise, go back to bed. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nagra, um, what, what are your thoughts on, on dementia, and specifically in people who are trying to take care of themselves, are eating plant-based, saying that they're following your ideal diet. Are you, are you seeing patients with, with dementia coming in? Um, I haven't really uh, personally, but, uh, but certainly I, I, you know, extended family and, and, uh, and I've spoken a lot with my friends and colleagues, doctors, Dean and Aisha Shurzai, they're neurologists working out of California with a specific focus on this area on dementia research. Um, and, uh, they wrote the book, the Alzheimer's solution for anybody here who is familiar. Um, and you know, they, they do talk about the vast majority of cases of Alzheimer's are certainly lifestyle, uh, based or, or lifestyle contributes to, um, there is a subset where it appears to be a genetic as well. So, um, there are cases where genetically you're predisposed and, and obviously you work with what you can and, and you focus on the lifestyle factors. And those are things like a healthy diet, exercise, uh, brain games, something I mentioned earlier that you're challenging your brain, uh, making sure that it doesn't you know, become too lax as far as, uh, as far as learning new things and whatnot. Um, and, and just yeah, doing your best in that way. Um, obviously you can't avoid everything. Um, but, but it can certainly stack the cards in your favor. Yeah, you. I, I'd like to add a point of agreement. Uh, the, the other, you know, I told you 60 to 80% of Alzheimer's are due to aluminum poisoning or 60 to 80% of the dementia or due to Alzheimer's, all of the, basically all of the Alzheimer's due to lumen, is that there's another component to this and that has to do uh, with the diet. Uh, uh, people on a high fat, high cholesterol diet, uh, like for example, you compare uh, people in Europe with people in rural Asia, there's a dramatic difference in incidence of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And it's because of the food. Uh, I think what happens is this, is you end up eating an unhealthy diet, the American diet, high fat, high cholesterol, low fiber, et cetera, meat-based diet, and you get sick. And, and the system can't defend and repair itself as well. And as a consequence, you know, barriers that we have, say, for example, to keep the aluminum out are not as effective. So yeah, this does have to do with you tr what you traditionally think about in terms of diet and lifestyle disease. It has to do with the meat, the dairy, et cetera. But I had to throw that part in about the aluminum because that's something you can do right now easily is you can stop ingesting aluminum. It's a non-nutrient, it's a poison. So Dr. McDougall, you, you've written about um, working with native populations and that's kind of where you got your, your the, the epiphany that you know eating a starch-based diet was, uh, you know, this traditional diet from all these different populations was really the, the natural way of eating. And uh, Dr. Nagra was just talking about how uh, there's a genetic component to uh, to Alzheimer's. Were you seeing Alzheimer's in people who were eating that traditional diet? The, you no, know, the no but, I, but I wouldn't rely on the amount of observation I had okay. back, back 50 years ago. Um, so, so, you know, genetics is always an issue, you know, in every disease, smoking, heart attacks, weight gain. It's always an issue, your, your, your family makeup. So yeah, I can't control that. You, Patients can't change their genes. We have to talk about something we can do something about, like, you know, the aluminum or the high fat, high cholesterol Western diet. Yeah, I, I had a chance to study uh, rural populations, native populations. That's why some of you probably recognize my 
my background here. It has to do with the time I spent in Hawaii uh, back between uh, 1972 and, well, the most important time was between 72 and, uh, well, actually it was 73 and 76. I was a sugar plantation doctor on the big island of Hawaii. I had 5,000 patients I took care of. I did everything. I caught their babies. I did brain surgery. You know, I pushed pills. Now, I was a, a regular old doctor back then. And I had two observations, which I'd like to share with you if I have a minute. One is I was a lousy doctor. My patients did terrible when I practiced medicine of drugs and devices. They did hor- They never got better. And I knew they should get better because I came up from a time of Dr. Welby, Mark, uh, Ben Casey, and Dr. Kilder, Kildare, Marcus Welby. Okay, that was my day. I knew what miracle doctors did. I wasn't doing that. I, my patients never got well. Well, you know, when I sewed up lacerations or set broken bones, they were pleased, but in general, not. So that's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned was from my patients directly, and that is I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. First generation means they were raised in Japan or the Philippines on a diet of rice and vegetables. They moved to Hawaii, started the second generation. They had kids and they became influenced by Western civilization. You know, we had up from our sugar plantation in Honoka, uh, we had a uh, Texas driver in the home of the Malasada. You know, they really got enthused with the Western diet. And the third generation fully westernized. In fact, maybe worse because there's some of the most unhealthy people around the, the citizens of Hawaii. So right in front of me, I had a, a contrast of people who were extremely well, never overweight, never with heart disease or strokes or, or rheumatoid arthritis or multiples, never, ever. And I had their, their offspring, same kind of work, same genetics. The only difference was in the food. So my patients taught me, first of all, my shortcomings, and second of all, what the problem is and what the solution is. Thank you. And I got a question for you, Chef AJ, a little bit of a, of a different topic. So um, so uh, um, Dr. Mandugal talks a lot about uh, about potatoes and starches. And you, uh, during our uh, your, your cooking demo earlier today, you talked about your your favorite food, your your lunch. Can you tell us a little bit about that and a great way to prepare it? Absolutely. Well, uh, for 12 years now, every day I ate the same lunch. It's a hana yam, which is my favorite kind of sweet potato. It's not orange. It's kind of beige. Uh, You can't get them everywhere, but most places, if you look in ethnic markets, they could be called a hana yam, a Jersey sweet potato, a white sweet potato. They're more, they're more like a Yukon gold than they are a sweet, sweet potato. They're not mushy like the orange ones, which I don't really care for. And they're just delicious. And I eat about a pound and a half of them. That's the way. I mean, I don't weigh and measure my food. I just, I look for the biggest one in the store sells which is usually about two pounds. And after I roast it for 90 minutes, it, it's about a pound and a half. And it's it's just so delicious. And I eat it with broccoli because it, it, it's kind of sweet. And I eat I have a pound of broccoli and it's it's like so filling and it's so delicious. And when I have to travel to Mexico, which I do frequently for a job and I can't get them, I just, I mean, you know, I'm eating other starches like rice and, and other kinds of potatoes and millet. And I just, I just, I love sweet potatoes. I mean, I, I Dr. McDougall once said you could live on sweet potatoes and broccoli and I took it seriously because I, it is my favorite food. And I think if I was going to be executed for a crime that I probably didn't commit, that would be my last meal because it's so good. But you got to roast them. Don't steam them. Don't, you got to roast your sweet potatoes. When you when you microwave them or steam them, they're mushy and they don't have the sweetness and the caramelization. But yeah, sweet potatoes is my, I, I just love them so much. And and how would you prepare that? What would be a simple way for so your- so Chef Chef Bravo at True North taught me the easiest way because I used to sit there and wash them and poke them. And when you poke them, you know sometimes it oozes out and it messes up whatever you're cooking them on. You just cut the tip off just very gently on both ends, and then the steam can escape without messing up your oven the way you do. I don't know where people started poking them because when you poke them, it just oozes everywhere. Ninety minutes at four hundred, but remember, I'm cooking very very large ones, and they last about a week in the fridge. So so I have my my lunch for a week, you know, and I pull it out. The thing is, is I have a dog that loves them too. And we fight for them. You know, she, she it's, it's crazy. And now a lot of people wrap their potato in aluminum foil. I never Obviously, understood that. that. We want to do. 
No, I don't even, I never use foil. I hear it's not good for you. If you do use foil, you've got to wrap it in parchment paper first because aluminum's not good for you. So I, I don't know where that came from. I know restaurants do that, you know, but so how, how do you, you just put it on a pan in the oven? I use, I use something called, it's, it's like a nonstick silicone baking pan because it's just easier to clean. And if I use parchment paper, then I have to keep using another piece, which isn't great. Um, I, I mean, I could run and get it if you want, but it's, it's basically, it's called a silk pad or a nonstick silicone baking mat, which is oven safe to 550 degrees. And that's what I use. And I use it over and over and over again. Okay. Thank you. I'm definitely going to try that out. So um, Dr. Nagra, do People eating a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet get heart disease and cancer and all these things. And, and what kind of rates do you see, you know, Alzheimer's, all the stuff that we've been talking about, do, do they, you know, what kind of rates do you see of, of the, of the top killers um, with people who are eating this, the plant-based diet? So we do have, I, I would say we have data on people eating plant-based diets in general. We don't have solid data on long-term follow-ups of people eating exactly the way that you're describing now. You know, if we look at a meta-analysis from 2017, uh, and they're separated into, you know, vegans, vegetarians, and, and meat eaters, uh, you see that vegans have about a 15% lower risk of developing cancer compared to meat eaters. But again, this is vegans as a umbrella. So people eating strictly plant-based diets, not necessarily what you're talking about. Uh, and we do have a lot of data on, again, uh, those healthier plant-based foods and, and their association with, with risk as well, suggesting that, hey, maybe if you're eating more on the whole food side, you'd be even lower risk. As far as, you know, do they get these diseases at all? I mean, yeah, it, it can still happen. A lot of people adopt these dietary patterns late down the road once they've already developed, you know, disease to a degree. Um, and so at that point, it's a lot harder to fix the problem, but you can certainly slow down the progression and, and hopefully stop the progression. Um, but, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be super confident in saying it's like hundred percent guarantee or anything because nothing really is. There's always going to be risk there. It's about modifying the equation, you know, lowering the risk as much as possible, doing what we can to control the risk factors that, that we can, um, you know, like we've talked about genetics and things as well. So, um, so I can't give you an exact number for what you're asking about just because we don't have that data really. And, and Dr. McDougall, I'll ask you about, about your, your own diet, the starch, you know, the starch solution type of diet. What kind of uh, health results do you see out of that? We, we've, we've published our results. You know, we published our results uh, showing what happens in seven days. And I have two independent studies showing what happens in a year. One done, done by Oregon Health and Science University. So we have them. Uh, the result is, is in seven days, people drop their cholesterol 22 milligrams per deciliter. In seven days, uh, people with high blood pressure, and 140 over 90 or greater, and most are on medication, uh, they drop their blood pressure 18 over 11 millimeters of mercury in seven days. And by the way, nearly 90% of people get off or reduce their medications during that seven day period of time. Uh, so, you know, we have published results on insulin levels, on fatigue levels, you know, all kinds of things. So I'd like to point out, again, not in any disagreement, the studies done on vegetarians, vegans, et cetera, show similar results to what we just talked about. But the, and, and that's why I don't teach a vegan or vegetarian diet. What I teach is a diet of starch, starch-based, because we've got thousands of papers studying disease incidents in various countries in various times. Like, for example, uh, research published in China. Uh, before 1980, in China, Obesity type 2 diabetes were virtually unknown on a diet of 90% starch. In 2013, when I first ran across the recent data, and they got even more recent data, in China, 12% of the population are frankly diabetic and half are pre-diabetic. That's what happened in 40 years when they gave up the starch-based diet. So we've got data on Japan. For example, after World War II in Japan, there was virtually no breast cancer or prostate cancer. You can count it in a in a in a you know, on a few handfuls of fingers, the number of cases that they can find in the entire country of Japan on, on breast and prostate cancer. And, and you look at the African work, I've studied uh, research out of Africa for my whole career. And you find the same thing in rural Africa, these diseases do not exist. Are they vegan? Probably not. You know, if a, if a pork chop ended up on the Sunday dinner table, they'd probably eat it. Are they starch eaters? Yes, they are. So you know, that's why I've got away from the terminologies, uh, whole food, starch-based diet, vegetarian diet, vegan diet. Not that they aren't 
proper descriptions. They're just not descriptive enough. You know, descriptive enough is you eat the bulk of the calories from starch, and then you eat some fruit and some green yellow vegetables, and we serve no animal foods. You know, Mary and I eat no animal foods. But when I tell somebody that they couldn't have a piece of turkey on Thanksgiving, et cetera, only from a religious point of view or, a, you know, a, a concern for the planet or, or animal rights, I mean, which are really valid. In fact, issues I spend more of my time on than, than health these days, they're really important issues. But you don't have to be a vegan, except, that, except for one thing. I want to throw in one caveat is you really have to be because you can't do a little bit. And that's the problem with the patients we're taking care of is they have been raised on the Western diet. They're used to it. They quote, love it. They don't know any better. They're raised on the Western diet. And as a result, they're habituated, strongly habituated. Some people use the word addiction. And so for them, you know, just like for other people with one cigarette, if they're tobacco addicts, and one drink, if you're an alcoholic, you know what happens? You know, some of these people out there, it's, you know, one slice of cheesecake and they're down every buffet in town. They can't stop. So it's much easier to be vegan, 100% or 100% oil free than it is to do exactly what I told you, which is a starch based diet with giving you a little latitude. You take that latitude and you're off for trouble is all I can say. Yeah. And then I'd agree with you too, uh, as far as like, you, know, you you don't necessarily need to be a hundred percent in order to reap the health benefits. Like you said, you know, once you, you know, a special occasion, Thanksgiving, whatever, um, isn't necessarily going to affect everything, but it could be a slippery slope for a lot of people. Um, and, and certainly as far as, you know, look at certain populations, rural China, rural Africa, and, and they tend to have lower rates of these, these diseases. Um, I, I prefer to look at data within a population just because then you're controlling for other variables, right? If we compare, um, rates in China to America, well, there are so many differences. It's not just diet. There are, there are tons of differences between those populations. And when we look at these sort of country to country comparisons, actually countries with the highest meat consumption have the highest life expectancy. In fact, countries with the highest cigarette consumption per capita have the highest life expectancy. But we know that when you look at a defined population, those who smoke more have higher risk. So is it smoking leading to, to greater life expectancy? No. It's the fact that those people typically are of higher affluence, you know, greater socioeconomic status, uh, and that's a huge predictor as well. So, so I, I tend to favor those within population comparisons uh, for a bit greater uh, internal validity in the statistics. Now, all, the, all the information is of value. Mm. And I do look at you know, studies done on, on just one population of people. I'm very familiar with that literature. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, it just makes the picture a lot more clear just like I told you the story about my plantation days on the sugar plantation. You know, I, you know I, my first generation patients never had these problems. Second, third, and fourth, they're fat and sick. Uh, that, that's, that's more of an interpopulation study than you've ever seen. It was my patients. So I, I'm going to change the subject over to salt. Uh, many speakers recommend no salt. Um, but the the book, the salt fix recommends salt. Is salt good? Is salt bad? Um, some say um, we need to um, that we needed to hold water in the cells. That's one thing. And then the second question is, um, Dr. Greger talks about substituting um, potassium chloride for for uh, sodium chloride for for salt. Is that a good substitute? Are there health risks to potassium chloride? So I'll, I'll ask that uh, of um, of Dr. Um, Dr. McDougall. Um, I think he, oh, he's muted. He's yeah, muted. Hold on. He muted himself. Yeah, there you go. You're, you're unmuted now. Okay. I got some, I got some, I think important thoughts on salt. Uh, first of all, we're salt seekers. Human body is designed to seek salt. We have uh, salt taste buds on the tip of the tongue. That was not a mistake. I think a, a certain amount of salt is, is uh, necessary and healthful. Uh, I think salt, high salt diets, uh, when you get into the extreme, say 11 to 15 grams a day, then you can have valid reasons to think there's a problem. All right. Uh, if you take the salt out of the diet, say, for example, you take and do a study, you know, interpopulation study, where you um, reduce the sodium intake by 1,750 milligrams from 3,500 milligrams a day, 
the reduction in blood pressure is like three millimeters of mercury systolic and a half a millimeter of mercury diastolic. It hardly makes any difference at all. But, and I, I talked to you about the Kempner diet, which is really low in salt, it's fewer than a half a gram. And it's very, very powerful. So when you get to those extremes, you really have a powerful maneuver to make. But the most important thing is people love to eat salt. And so like, we just started a program tonight. That's why I was a little late. So we run a 12-day internet-based program you know, every month or two. And we just started a new big group. And I told them, I said, look, you may not like the food when you first start. Just take out the salt shaker and sprinkle it on the, on the soup or the salad or whatever. You'll love it. You see, you see the, 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 the salt, uh, it's, it's not the issue. The issue is the issue is the pig. Okay, it's not, not the bacon that causes people to be sick. In other words, the salt in the pig. It's the pig. It's, it's a confounding variable that makes people ill. And so salt's really got a bad reputation. It's got, it's a scapegoat. But again, I say that with the idea that there is a level of sodium intake and there are certain people, certainly people, patients, like my patients with severe heart failure, severe edema problems, certain kidney disorders, they have to be on a rigorously low salt diet. But I don't think the general population should strive for that. I think they should strive for a salt. What, what we teach is this, is the basic McDougall diet is 500 milligrams of sodium. If you add a half a teaspoon of salt, you add 1,125 milligrams of sodium. You've now brought the sodium intake up to 1,600 milligrams. If you have a massive heart attack and end up in the ICU, their low salt diet is 2,000 milligrams. Ours is 400 milligrams fewer than the person dying in intensive care unit from heart disease. So we serve a low-salt diet, but we put the salt where people can taste it on the surface of the food. They love it. And then they immediately love the diet. So, you know, you got to be careful about what you say about salt. I can also make the argument, as you brought up, that, uh, you know, there's, there's evidence that severe salt restriction like the NHANES study. The NHANES study found that people who take in very or higher salt diets live longer. So, you know, it, there's a lot of mixed evidence, but I think you can be certain of one fact. God didn't make a mistake by putting salt taste buds on the tip of the tongue. You don't enjoy salt as a mistake. You are a salt seeker. Salt's not the problem. It's, it's the pig, not the bacon. So for those that want to avoid salt, and, you know, going back to the potassium chloride, what I'm not, I'm not saying that they should, but for those that, that do want to, is potassium chloride safe? It's dangerous. Okay. It's not just not safe. I had a patient that almost had a cardiac arrest one night because his wife tried to make the spaghetti sauce with a half a box of, of no salt. Okay. So, you know, sodium potassium chloride is not a natural agreement, uh, ingredient in the environment. Uh, this is something people do because they're, they're so phobic about sodium. And I think it's a very unwise thing to do besides that it tastes terrible. So no, I would not recommend it to any patient ever. Uh, okay. And uh, Dr. Nagra, what are your thoughts on, on salt? So yeah, as far as salt restriction, I don't think we need to go right to zero. You know, as, as Dr. Madugo had said, I, I think um, within reason up, up to a, even about that, you know, 2000, 2300 mark, you don't really see an increase in risk of, of adverse health outcomes. It, at least the serious health, health outcomes tend to be well above that amount. Um, so using a bit to flavor your food, especially as Dr. McDougall said, on the food, not necessarily mixed in where you don't taste as much, but on the food, you tend to use very little and it can help flavor it and, and hopefully get you eating more of those healthy foods, you know, the, the vegetables and whatnot as well. Um, so I would agree with that. As far as the potassium chloride, I mean, I've definitely seen uh, research, uh, you know, swapping salt for potassium chloride and reducing stroke risk. Uh, in, in various randomized controlled trials. Um, but I think there is a risk there for people with like kidney disease and whatnot, where using those potassium based salts can be an issue because potassium intake, you know, has to be limited during that time. Uh, so that's certainly a concern. And definitely you don't want to be using, uh, you know, a huge, huge amount of it as may have been the, the case there with, with one of Dr. Medugal's patients. Um, but, uh, but it, it just depends on your health status and, and, uh, um, if you are otherwise healthy, I don't see an issue with using a bit of it to flavor food. But um, again, some people don't actually like the flavor that much either, as, as Dr. McDougall had, had mentioned there. 
But and, we've been using these salt substitutes for you know as long as I've been in the, in medicine. Look how popular they are these days. Nobody buys them. They don't like them. Uh, do you find people, your patients, get into these potassium chloride? I, I've certainly had some use them and, and actually like them a lot. Um, I find that, and this is my personal opinion on it, is that they taste off by themselves, but when mixed into food, they do have a salty flavor. It's kind of odd how that works, um, but uh, but using it in a bit of food, um, I've noticed that it gives it a bit of a salty kick. And Chef AJ, um, you were you were uh, discussing earlier today during your your uh, your demonstration uh, about using seasoning for oh. a set of salt and that that salt was sort of the the, the, the cheater's way out I've got I think, exactly I right there. think salt is a cheap and lazy way to season and uh with all due respect to Dr McDougall I never cared for salt but I was raised on a no salt diet my father was 50 when I was born and had already suffered his first heart attack so my family didn't cook with salt and I don't remember actually tasting salt until I was seven years old I was at a cousin's house and she handed me one of those pretzel rods with the salt on the outside and I spit it out I thought it was disgusting so I never developed a taste of salt like unfortunately I did for, for sugar. So I'm not here to tell people to eat it or not eat it, but that I agree with Dr. McDougall that if they eat it, it should be on the surface of the food where the taste buds of the tongue can taste it. Then you'll use it judiciously. There is no point in cooking with it because it, like which it just completely dissipates. You know, that's why people get more salt from eating things like bread and processed food than even from French fries or potato chips where the salt is on the surface. So people are going to use salt. I say, use it as the finish at the table and let everybody add how much they want. Don't let the chef decide, you know, I, I, you, you know, you've probably seen these people that salt their food before they even taste it. H how do they know? So, if, so, and I don't eat zero salt, by the way, I eat condiments with salt. I have barbecue sauce with salt, ketchup, mustard, salsa. So it's not like I'm on a zero salt diet. I just prefer to not cook with it and relying on other flavors to make it delicious. And I don't get complaints about my food that it needs salt, but I do own salt if people want to add it, but usually they don't. There are so many delicious spices now. There's a place called Local Spicery near me, and they also offer spices online. He just developed a vegan bacon spice. I love when Dr. McDougall said it's not the salt, it's the pig. But if people like that bacony taste, he made a salt-free, sugar-free bacon spice that will knock your socks off. So I I just find that salt is lazy and not very creative. And I say, have it for the people that want to add it to the table. Don't cook with it. I recently had a Dr. Clarence Grimm on my show. It was introduced by Dr. McDougall, who worked with Kempner. And he said, where there is no salt, there is no high blood pressure. And that he claims to be the world's leading expert on hypertension. So I don't want to get into medically, but from a culinary standpoint, if you learn how to cook food properly, you know, the other thing is, is citrus, lemon and lime juice, for example, our taste buds for sour sit right next to our taste buds for salt. And so when you give yourself something like balsamic vinegar or some kind of vinegar or citrus, you feel like you've had something salty when it didn't. You know, when you're a hammer, you look at everything like a nail. And because most of the time I work with people that are food addicted, that are trying to lose weight, the more they salt the food, the more they'll eat. When we reduce the salt or take it away, it doesn't taste as good like Dr. McDougall says, which is good because then they won't eat as much. <laughs> and so what would you recommend, uh, just if you had to give the audience a, a couple of tips on seasoning that uh, you, you gave them the, uh, the lemon and lime, the, the citric acid, what else would, um, yeah. is good for uh, yeah. missing salt? So there are salt-free seasonings that are not fake or potassium chloride. There's Benson's Table Tasty that's excellent. I know uh, Dr. McDougall's wife, Mary, likes the one from, I believe it's called from Kirkland, from Costco, or 21. Uh, there, there's a really delicious one that they sell at Trader Joe's. There's so, even Mrs. I, think, I don't know if it's called Mrs. Dashes any, anymore, but there are so many delicious blends already. Frontier, just in your regular Rayleigh's grocery store. So try them. And, you know, you can all, you could always add salt afterwards if you don't like it. But try to use, try more herbs and spices. They have medicinal properties. They're delicious. Smoked paprika, chipotle powder, jalapeno powder. You know, you, you um, there's just so many delicious flavors that you can be using in addition or instead of salt. Okay. Uh, now, Chef AJ had mentioned uh, the, the idea of addiction to food. Dr. McDougall, what do you think about food addiction? Is that a real thing? Well, you know, uh, Chef AJ and I actually had a chance to talk about that uh, this past Monday. I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't I don't object to the word of addiction. I just have a hard time relating to it. 
you know, in my life personally, I've had, you know, some addiction issues like tobacco, for example. Uh, I know what real withdrawal from an addictive substance is like. Uh, I don't see people giving up uh, uh, steaks and, and cheesecakes and so on, going through the kind of withdrawal that an alcoholic goes through when they quit booze. Those are addictions or a heroin addict to go through when they quit their opioids. So, you know, when I think of addiction, I think of this kind of serious relationship that when you stop it, you go through withdrawal. I mean, painful withdrawal. And uh, I don't see that in my patients. So I have to call it habituated uh, rather than addiction because of my reference point. Dr. Nagra, what are your thoughts on the subject? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think that that's actually a really interesting perspective as far as like what would classify as addiction. I mean, I, I, I would say um, that food addiction is certainly a thing and exists, you know, and the way I would look at it is, is this sort of um, you know, craving or need for something that affects your life, like affects your daily life. Um, and, you know, I think that can absolutely be the case for food uh, for, for a lot of people. The issue is, you know, how is that diagnosed? How is that treated? Like we don't have a firm diagnostic criteria for something like that, uh, which also makes it a bit subjective and a bit more difficult to, to give a, a firm answer for. But, but I, I would say I, I lean on the side of, yeah, it is a thing, but, um, but how do we classify that and, and uh, treat it is a whole other question. I, I've, ne I've never seen anybody have seizures uh, giving up chocolate cake, but I have seen- Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't take the position that that a uh, withdrawal is necessary to to claim something is an addiction. That, that's the the difference in the, the sort what of criteria. Caffeine, for example, I've gone off of caffeine and it's you know I'll get you get a headache and and that type of stuff, but that's, that's that pretty addiction. mild. I, I would call that addiction because you have a withdrawal symptom, and that's why you know from my reference point, from you know having the the knowledge of what happens to people when they give up coffee. We used to we used to. When we didn't serve coffee at our program, we do now, we sort of dark teas, black teas, is we used to have withdrawal so severe in our participants that came to the program that they would often spend the first two days in bed. You know, they were so depressed, uh, they had such terrible headaches. That's an addiction. Again, I don't, I don't see that kind of, of uh, physiologic change taking place when people give up pork chops or whatever. So I'm going to change the subject to supplementation. Um, so in, in a plant-based diet, um, Dr. McDougall, uh, what are your thoughts on supplementation? Obviously, uh, B12, um, from what I understand, people are pretty much universally in agreement that B12 is not in the diet. Um, do you agree with that? And then what other supplementation do you recommend for uh, a plant-based diet? Well, since I wrote my first book, which is you know, a long time, four, plus 40 years ago, I have recommended in the front of each book that people take a B12 supplement. A five micrograms a day uh, would be fine. Uh, there are all kinds. I've, I've written two articles that are on my website that talk about B12. So let's just say that, you know, I recommend it, everybody recommends it. I could sit and argue with you as to really how valid or important the, the recommendation is. Uh, B12 deficiency in terms of disease occurs in about one in a million people. Heart attacks are one in two. So, you know, the, the relevance, again, when you're getting somebody to change their diet, the, the last bastion that meat eaters hold against a vegan or vegetarian diet is B12, because everything else is proven to be incorrect. There's no protein deficiency, amino acid deficiency, calcium deficiency, et cetera. So the last thing they hold out on, well, you're going to get B12 deficiency. Well, what's the risk? One on a man. What is the consequence? Tingly fingers and tingly toes. <laughs> it's silly. Anyway, you want to talk about uh, supplements in general. I, I think they're, I, th I don't know how to say it strongly enough. I, I think they're dangerous. I think they're, it's a con job on the public. Um, they are isolated, concentrated nutrients that create nutritional imbalances within the cells. Uh, for example, you take vitamin D in doses greater than 2000 international units. You have an increased risk of falls and fractures. When you take beta carotene compared to a placebo, you have an increased risk of lung cancer. These supplements create imbalances that create disease. Don't do it. The foods are properly packaged, the proper amount, you know, the, the proper relationship in things called bananas. 
Okay. Now, um, now you mentioned D in particular. Is less than 2,000 international units okay? And is that suggested? I don't think it's necessary. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's been found to be relatively safe, say 400 or 600 or 800 international units. Uh, 2,000 is the number that's usually given for what you don't want to go above. Uh, but you, if you go to the internet, you'll find that a typical dose is 5,000 international units. So yeah, if you if you believe that you need vitamin D, you know, say if you've got a vitamin D test, or you you, you live in Boston and work in an office all day long, you know, then a couple couple hundred, four hundred international units that would be not harmful, but it's not necessary. Okay, where does vitamin D come from? It's not a vitamin; it's a hormone. Where does it come from? It comes from the action of sunshine on the skin. You need to be out in the sun. The sun offers you so many positive things that aren't even touched by B12, by vitamin D. So, you know, what does sunshine cost? Nothing. And what does supplements cost? Lots. <laughs> you know, like, like, I mean, I, I listen to some of these people who sell supplements that make a million dollars a year, fooling the public and hurting them too. Not just fooling them, taking their money. Was I clear? I think I'm going to make sure I didn't, but there wasn't any misunderstanding about what I had to say about I supplements. I think you're pretty clear. And Dr. Nagra, what are your thoughts? on? Yeah, I mean, for, for B12, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, I think that is a really important one. And yeah, you, know, you can have numbness, tingling. You can also have dementia-like symptoms. So I, I, I wouldn't want to mess around with vitamin B12. As far as vitamin D, it depends on, on a lot of factors. Some Dr. McDougall mentioned, like, do you work in an office? Do you live in, I mean, you mentioned Boston, I'm in Vancouver, I don't get a lot of sunshine, it's it's pretty, you know, overcast today. And we're just starting to get into sunshine territory here in the last week. So, um, and I have darker skin tone. So I don't produce as much vitamin D from sun exposure, therefore, supplementation is a good idea. In fact, I, I did test uh, about a year and a half ago, and I was low. Um, and, and, you know, that's sort of expected for someone with my skin tone living in Canada. Um, and so I, I do think it is important depending on certain variables. If you're living in California or Florida, hey, you probably don't have to worry about it. Um, and of course, if you're getting outside regularly. As far as other nutrients, it just depends on the diet. I think a lot of the the um, the other nutrients that are often focused on things like iron, calcium, et cetera, can be obtained through the diet. But if you are lacking in any way, or if you do have iron deficiency, let's say you're you're a woman of, of menstruating age and and uh, you happen to have heavy uh, menstrual periods, then perhaps you are losing more iron than you're taking in and a supplement might be uh, warranted um, if you can't get that under control otherwise. But, um, but generally speaking, I think B12 is the must and then um, other supplements just depend on where you're at. I'd like to object. You, you, told, you told what proper medicine involves when it comes to iron deficiency and you just told the whole audience, you look for the source of blood loss. That's how you treat iron deficiency anemias. You always look for the source first, menstrual loss, GI loss, et cetera. You don't start out by giving them iron supplements. That's the last thing you do, or that's the ancillary thing you do. You must find out why they're losing iron. Yeah, so, I, agree. I would agree with that, but I would, I would supplement in the, in the interim, right? I would definitely supplement to get, if someone, like I've had a patient who came in with a ferritin that just read less than one and a hemoglobin of like 85. Um, I'm not going to withhold supplementation from that patient while I try to investigate what the cause could be. I'm going to put them on an iron supplement while I investigate what the cause could be. Um, and then if we can get that under control, great. Maybe we can come off an iron supplement down the road. But um, I, I think it would be negligence to not put them on a supplement then and there, or, or perhaps even infusions if, if the supplement isn't working. Well, just to add to the iron discussion is plants are loaded with iron. You know, uh, when, when studies are done on, on vegans or vegetarians and their iron levels or risk of uh, anemia, they, they don't turn out to be of any concern at all. Not only that, but ascorbic acid causes iron to be more efficiently absorbed. So um, the kind of diet we recommend your ascorbic acid intake, vitamin C, vitamin C intake is high. So you enhance the absorption of iron. So I don't really find it an issue, but you know, I would do the same thing that you do. In the sense that if I found somebody with a GI bleed, I'd probably put them on iron supplements. That was the way I was trained. You know, I realize they're going to get constipated. I realize they're going to have black tarry stools, but it's not all that harmful. And you're covering all bases. But to recommend an iron supplement and neglect the food, I think it's wrong. 
you know, if you, well, I don't, I don't think anybody is, is doing that. Yeah. I don't think anybody's doing that. Well, if you start out by, by, uh, you know, some, but tip, you know, I think they are all doing it. If a typical doctor, uh, somebody comes in with iron deficiency before they do stool tests or do a menstrual history, they're, they got the prescription pad, uh, you know, recommending ferrous sulfate. No, you start with finding the cause of blood loss. And, and I want to add one more thing. <laughs> After you have dealt with the, the bleed from the uterus and from the GI tract, then the next thing you have to consider is the diet. Dairy, we're talking about milk and cheese, yogurt, et cetera, is the number one cause of iron deficiency anemia in children and probably adults. What happens is the, uh, the, the calcium complexes, or complex, the calcium and phosphorus in milk complex the iron and make insoluble complexes. In other words, it can't be brought into the body, stuck in the gut. And the other thing is the milk protein causes microscopic GI bleeding. It's a condition that was described, well, it still goes on today, so I don't need to be historical about you, but it was described in the 1920s. Uh, iron deficiency anemia in, in children, infants. And you know, you cannot correct that anemia by giving uh, blood transfusions, iron supplements. The only way you can correct it is taking the kids off the milk. I think they call so, it. so so just just so I'm clear, there's no evidence of of fixing an iron deficiency in dairy consumers with supplementation or infusions. That's not what I said. Well, you said you can't fix the the deficiency um, in people without getting them off dairy or with infusions I, or supplements. I, 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 no, I didn't say that. Just because it causes I a twelve, I don't need to misinterpret me. I didn't say you know it's like everybody that drinks dairy is iron deficient. That's not true. The effect of dairy, and I'm sure you're going to look it up after we're done here. The effect of dairy is the calcium and phosphorus complex the iron and make it insoluble. And that dairy causes microscopic bleeding. Now, it may not be enough, neither one of those factors, to create a large population of people with iron deficiency anemia. But in those that have it, particularly children, particularly infants, those who have it, you must think that first. And in adults, you know, after you look at the other sources of blood loss, like ulcers and diverticular disease and colon cancer, and polyps and you know, uterine bleeding. A after you've done that, uh, you know, you really need to seriously consider another maneuver that will help your patients, which is get them off the dairy. It's as important as giving them an iron supplement. Okay. Um, how about iodine? How, it, iodine deficiency. Is that something that uh, that we should be supplementing? Is uh, is seaweed something that is a valid source of iodine that uh, that plant based people can consume to keep their iodine where it needs to be? I'll ask that a big Google. Well, uh, iodine deficiency used to be a really serious problem. Uh, is still today in Africa. It used to be in the 1920s in the goiter belt, which is around the Great Lakes. Twenty percent of the people had goiters back in the 1920s. And it was due to iodine deficiency because people ate food grown in their locale within 25 miles of their hut. So as a result, if, you, if the, the foods were grown in an iron, uh, iodine deficient soil, they're likely to get iodine deficiency, but we don't eat that way. You know, we get apples from Washington, we get corn from Nebraska, you know, we get potatoes from Idaho. We have such a variety that I don't ever see iodine deficiency as a cause of thyroid problems. I, I don't see it, nor would I reach to iodine supplements or seaweed as a solution. I would put them on Synthroid because their problem is due to an autoimmune disease, which is called autoimmune thyroiditis, which is due to the food. It's a, it's a reaction to dairy and meat and cow and pig thyroid glands. Okay, thank you for that. And we've got one minute. So with one minute left, um, Dr. Nagra, what's, um, Nagra, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, iodine, especially with the, the way that, you know, a lot of people, especially in the, the plant-based community are uh, avoiding or limiting salt and switching to like, you know, sea salts and things that aren't typically iodized. I do think it is a potential concern. Um, and, you know, again, supplementation is one easy way. Uh, using an iodized salt uh, is another way uh, if they were to start including it. Um, but there, at the same time, we don't really have good uh, health outcome data suggesting that vegans are at higher risk of hypothyroidism or complications from iodine deficiency. So it, 
you know, in my view, it's more treated as a precautionary measure, measure just to make sure that you're getting it uh, in one way or another versus versus us being, you know, 100% confident that, yeah, it is absolutely something that we should be concerned about. Okay, thank you. And I want to thank all of the panelists for uh, for all of the information that they shared with us this evening. Chef AJ, Dr. Nagra, and Dr. McDougall. Um, I, we're going to open up the microphone real quickly so that the audience can uh, can say thank you to everybody, and it'll be some big cacophony of of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.